ओम भूर्भुव स्वह तत्सुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देवश्रदीम धियो यो न प्रचोदया शांति 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 ओके डियर फ्रेंड्स आई हैव टॉक्ड अबाउट Anam Rai Swami's book, Final Talks. In my first video, I have talked, and in the second video, I will start from this information. A devotee who came to Anam Rai Swami had so much pain in one of his legs. he found it very difficult to sit comfortably on the floor after anamla swami had observed the difficulties the man was having he made the following remarks anamla swami says though the body is needed for sadhana one should not identify with it we should make good use of it and look after it well but we should not pay too much attention to it there are so many thoughts in the mind thought after thought after thought they never stop but there is one thought that is continuous though it is mostly subconscious i am the body this is the string on which all other thoughts are threaded once we identify ourselves with the body by thinking this thought maya follows it also follows that if we cease to identify ourselves with the body maya will not affect us and see subconscious mind is very powerful exactly speaking this subconscious mind is just a quality of our soul it is so subtle you know when we are in the state of awakening and our conscious mind is working we may not know certain thoughts which are going on in our mind one of those thought is i am this body so that's why he used the word subconsciously this thought is going on in our mind subconsciously without our knowledge this this is there so that is the meaning maya is fundamentally non existent this is a power and this power is actually lead us from un reality to unreality so that is the problem this is confusing us actually speaking but this is very this is the shakti this is the power of our soul only power of brahma only bhagwan said that maya literally means that which is not actually it does not exist it is unreal because everything that maya produces is an outgrowth of wrong idea it is a consequence of taking something to be true that is not really true that's what i told you maya takes us from reality to unreality how can something that is not real produce something that is real so this is correct if a barren woman says that she has been beaten by her son or that she has been injured by the horns of a hare we would rightly take her to be deluded something that does not exist cannot be the cause of suffering or of anything else maya may appear to be real to have a real existence but this is a false appearance the truth is it is not real it has no existence at all so there are many things we talk about mind so much but actually speaking mind does not exist 
सेम वे ईगो डज नॉट एग्जिस्ट माया डज नॉट एग्जिस्ट सी दीज आर दी एट्रीब्यूट ऑफ अवर सोल अदरवाइज माइंड ईगो माया दीज डू नॉट हैव देयर इंडिपेंडेंट एग्जिस्टेंस how to get rid of this i am the body this feeling how we can get rid of and maya that is produced by it <clears throat> it goes when there is a saman bhava the equanimity or equality of outlook that leaves one unaffected by extreme opposite such as happiness and unhappiness pleasure and pain when some man bhava is attained the idea and the body is no longer present and maya is transcendent now question is put by a devotee to anamlai swami it says is the body to be regarded as unreal as not me what attitude should i have towards this body and all the sensory information it provides me with anam lai swami replies by itself this body is jada jada means non living insentient inert and lifeless without the mind the body cannot function and how does the mind function through the five senses that the body provides mind and body are like the tongue and teeth in the mouth they have to work in harmony with each other the teeth do not fight with the tongue and bite it mind and body should combine in the same harmonious way however if we want to go beyond the body beyond the mind we have to understand and fully accept that all the information the senses provide is not real like the mirage that produces an illusory oasis in the desert the senses create the impression that there is a real world in front of us that is being per- perceived by the mind see <clears throat> the mirage you know it takes place due to the principle of refraction of light when light passes from lighter medium to denser medium the rays of light deviate from their actual path and when they actually pass through a medium like prism and all there is a dispersion of light so due to this by delusion when we look to a certain distance it seems in the desert there is water but actually there is no water because in summer the sand becomes very hot so due to different densities of the air media this refraction takes place and mirage occurs so, so this is very simple thing the senses create the impression that there is a real world in front of us that is being perceived by mind the apparent reality of the world is an illusion like mirage it is merely a misperception when the mind perceives a snake where in reality there is only a rope this is clearly a case of the senses projecting an imaginary image onto a real substratum this on a large scale is how the unreal appearance of the world is projected by the mind and the senses onto the underlying reality of the self <coughs> once this happens we see the superimposition the unreal names and forms we have created and we forget about the substratum the reality that underlies them 
Now our soul is the substratum. Everything happens, occurs because the power to anything, any part of our body, mind, ego, maya, everything is getting power from our soul. That is the substratum. Many examples are given by our teachers and by our spiritual books. If you see a carved wooden elephant, for example, at some point you forget that it is only wood. You see the form of the carving and your mind gives that form the name elephant. While your mind is registering this name and this form, you are no longer registering the object as a block of wood. Because the basic thing is wood. Rest, the features, the model, everything is secondary. It is the same when you see jewelry made out of gold because gold is the basic material out of which the jewelry is made. But our whole attention is towards the form of the jewelry, not on the basic material out of which it is made. You see a shape, call it a ring or a necklace and while you are studying the form, you temporarily forget the substance it is made of. Same way, we talk about our body parts, we talk about maya, talk about ego, talk about mind, <laughs> but actual, the basic thing that is our soul is completely forgotten. Self-inquiry is the process by which attention is put on the substratum instead of on the names and forms that are habitually imposed on it. <clears throat> Self is the substratum out of which all things appear to manifest and the jnani is the one who is continually aware of the real substratum. He is never deluded into believing that the names and forms that are perceived by the senses have any real existence. See, due to the negligence about our soul, the complete lifespan is spent around mind, ego, my and all. This body, body parts, organs, etc. But completely, we are ignorant of our soul. So, that is the basic thing we are forgetting and we, our life is completely revolving around the non-real things, unreal things, unreality. So, what is the aim of talking about all this knowledge? We have to move from unreality to reality. That is the basic thing and that, that gives us self-realization, that gives us liberation. But <clears throat> whatever we see in this for room, for example, that picture of Bhagwan over there is unreal. It has no more reality than the objects we perceive in our dreams. We think we live in a real, materially substantial world and that our minds and bodies are real entities that move around in it. When the self is seen and known, all these ideas fade away and one is left with the knowledge self alone exists. See, all these things, you know, they are imposed upon our self. They are superimposed upon our self. So, instead of experience the, experiencing the self, we completely forget the self and we experience all unreal things like mind, ego and maya. Now, another devotee puts a question to Swami Anamalai. The question says, 
if i regard all the people that i see and meet as unreal projections what do i base my moral sense on i can go around killing them or robbing them without feeling guilty because i would know that they are just characters in my dream wonderful question <clears throat> and very intelligent question also now anam lai swami says please try to understand what anam lai swami says everything that we perceive is maya an unreal dream but one should not then think since everything is unreal i can do what i like no there are dream consequences for the bad acts committed in the dream and while you still take the dream to be the reality you will suffer the consequences of your bad behavior do no evil and have no hate have equanimity towards everything anam lai swami then turned to a devotee who had been sitting motionless with his eyes closed in front of him if you sit in meditation for a long time without moving the body the mind gets dull and tamsic even moving the toes while sitting is a good way of getting rid of the tamas mira bai used to dance and sing that's a good way to meditate giri pradikshana walking around arunachala is also good it is walking meditation anam lai swami he talks today i am going to tell you a story i once heard a rich man lived in a village from his youth till his old age he had spent all his life time accumulating wealth he owned many houses and vast tracts of land as his material wealth increased his ego expanded with it he enjoyed boasting about his wealth one day as he was sitting in front of his house with a stick in his hand a poor man who was known to be a little stupid passed by what are you holding that stick in your hand he asked the rich man decided to have some fun with him it is a special stick he replied it has to be given to an idiot this stick is passed from person to person and each person who receives it must pass it to on to someone who is more stupid than he is giving him the stick he continued now it is your turn to own it you must keep it with you until you find someone who is an even bigger idiot than you the poor man humbly accepted the stick and began his quest to find someone whom he felt had even less intelligence than he did since he was by a long way the least intelligent person in the village he could not find anyone to give the stick to a few weeks later he heard that the rich man was sick and dying he went to visit him partly to pay his last respects and partly to tell him that he had not managed to find any one to give the stick to he took his custody of the stick very seriously and he wanted advice from the rich man on what he should do with it after some preliminary conversation about the rich man's health and the fate of the stick the poor man asked the rich man what was going to happen to all his money when he died the rich man says i have to leave all my money here answered the rich man i do not know where and when i shall be reborn 
but I do know that I can't take any of my money with me. I shall have to start off with nothing again. He relapsed into a glum silence, not relishing the prospect of being parted from his money. The poor man, who had never really considered this aspect of dying before, thought about it for a while and then came to a conclusion. You must have the stick, he said, handing it back to him, because I have suddenly realized that you are an even bigger idiot than I am. Though you have had a long life and many opportunities, you have accumulated nothing of value then you can carry forward with you. You have no peace of mind because you are worried about losing your money and you have accumulated no good karma because you have spent your whole life pursuing selfish ends. In a few days, the piles of money you have amassed will have the same value for you as piles of garbage. This money will have no value for you in your next life. But devoting your entire life to the accumulation of things that will ultimately prove to be of no use, you have demonstrated that you are a worthy recipient of the stick. He placed the stick on the rich man's bed and left. That reminds me of his strange comment a disciple once made about his guru. He called his guru a heap of garbage and referred to himself as a hen. When he was asked about this, he replied, A hen can always find something good to eat so long as it keeps busy scratching around in the garbage, but effort is required if the hen stops scratching, the supply of food stops. The question is put to Anamlai Swami. I was not here yesterday, but I was told that someone asked the following question. I have been following Bhagwan's teaching for many years, but without any obvious benefits. I don't feel any peace. What am I doing wrong? Why am I not getting results? Anamlai Swami replies. Self-inquiry must be done continuously. It does not work if you regard it as a part-time activity. You may be doing something that doesn't hold your interest or attention. So you think I will do some inquiry instead. This is never going to work. You may go two steps forward when you practice, but you go five steps backward when you stop your practice and go back to your worldly affairs. You must have a lifelong commitment to establish your, yourself in the self. Your determination to succeed must be strong and firm, and it should manifest as continuous, not part-time effort. For many lifetimes you have been immersed in ignorance, you are habituated to it, all your deeply rooted beliefs, all your pattern of behavior reinforce ignorance and strengthen the hold it has over you. This ignorance is so strong, so deeply enmeshed in all your psychological structure. It takes a massive effort over a long period of time to break free from it. The habits and beliefs that sustain it have to be challenged again and again. Ignorance <clears throat> is ignorance of the self and to remove it, self-awareness is required. When you come to an awareness of the self, ignorance vanishes. If you don't lose contact with the self, ignorance can never arise. If there is darkness, you remove it by bringing light. Darkness is not something real and substantial that you have to dig out and throw away. It is just an absence of light, nothing more. When light is let into a dark room, the darkness is suddenly no longer there. 
it did not vanish gradually or go away piece by piece it simply ceased to exist when the room became filled with light this is just an analogy because the self is not like other lights it is not an object that you either see or don't see it is there all the time shining as your own reality if you refuse to acknowledge its existence if you refuse to believe that it is there you put yourself in an imaginary darkness it is not a real darkness it is just your own willful refusal to acknowledge that you are light itself this self inflicted ignorance is the darkness that has to be banished by the light of self awareness we have repeatedly to turn to the light of the self within until we become one with it bhagwan spoke about turning inward to face the self that is all that is needed if we look outwards we become entangled with objects and we lose awareness of the self shining within us but when by repeated practice we gain the strength to keep our focus on the self within we become one with it and darkness of self ignorance vanishes then even though we continue to live in this false and unreal body we abide in an ocean of bliss that never fades or diminishes see our soul you know it is nothing but eternal peace and bliss a realized soul you know is always full of bliss and peace because the very nature of soul is eternal peace and bliss this is not going to happen in a moment because lifetimes of wrong and ignorant thinking have made it impossible for most of us to focus intently and regularly on the self within if you leave your house and start walking away from it and if you continue this habit over many lives you will probably be a long long way from home when you finally decide that you have had enough and that you want to go back to where you started from don't be discouraged by the length of the journey and don't slacken in your efforts to get home turn 180 degree to face the source of your outward journey and keep moving back to where you started ignore the pain the discomfort and the frustration of seeming not to get anywhere keep moving back to your source and don't let anything distract you on the way take diversions or decide to flow uphill for a while it doesn't become distressed it just moves slowly and steadily back to the place its water originated from and when the river dissolves in ocean river is no more only ocean remains see this is like this pose a person is at present point at point a now he walks to a distance of 20 miles to another point b now to reach to reach back to a he has to cover that distance of 20 miles similarly as we have moved away from our soul due to ignorance so many lifetimes we have spent so this is the reason we have to struggle for a long time from moving on reality of the world to the reality of our 
soul. That's why so much sadhana, practice, japa, so many things we have to do. So, this is the basic thing. So, we should not lose our heart. We start doing sadhana and we do not get any result. So, we are disheartened. No, this is not the way. As we move to a certain distance, to go back to the original point, we have to cover the same distance. Basic thing. Basic mathematical calculation. Jiva, the individual self, came from Shiva and has to go back to Shiva again. If there is a big charcoal fire and one burning ember jumps out, the fire in the ember will soon go out. To reignite it, you have to put it back into the fire, back into its burning source. There is no happiness in separation. The jiva has no happiness. Contentment or peace so long as it remains a separate being. The separate being comes from the self. It has to go back there and, and there. Only then will there be eternal peace. The energy of the sea, when we are, uh, our soul is there in the body and it is there with the help of prana shakti. So, this we call it jiva, individual soul. This individual soul, when leaves the body and emerges into the universal soul that is Brahma, then only we say we are getting liberated. In the, the energy of the mind comes from where? It comes from the self. In the waking state, the mind functions as a separate entity. If the sleep state it goes in the sleep state it goes back to the source. Again and again it comes out and goes back. It does this because it doesn't know the truth of what it really is. See, the mind does not know what it is really. It is just nothing but thoughts coming out from the self. It is self and self alone, but it, ignorance of this fact makes it miserable. It is this feeling of separateness that gives rise to desires, suffering and unhappiness. Keep the mind in the self. If you can do this, you can live in peace both while you are awake and also while you are asleep. In deep sleep, all differences are dropped. If you keep the mind in the self during the waking state, there will also be no differences, no distinctions. You will see everything as your own self. Question is put to Anamla Swami. How can we recognize a jnani? Anamla Swami replies. For a mature seeker, there is one principal symptom of being in the presence of a jnani. If the seeker's mind becomes quiet without any effort, then this is a good indication. But this is not a test that is valid or conclusive for everyone. If an immature seeker sits in the presence of a jnani, his or her mind will probably remain just as active as ever. It is very difficult for ordinary people to determine who is and who is not a jnani. There are no consistently reliable tests. This reminds me of a story that was told by Ramakrishna. 
a sadhu was sitting in samadhi in the shade of a tree by the side of the road a man who was walking down the road glanced at the sadhu and thought he is probably drunk the sadhu was shaking a little and the passer by assumed it was a drunken tremble another man walked by but his train of thought led him to a different conclusion this man looks happy he is probably waiting for his girlfriend to come the sun was setting as the next man came along he saw the shadow figure sitting under the tree and thought he may be a thief he is probably hiding under the tree so that he can jump out and attack people who pass by i will give him a wide berth just in case he turns out to be dangerous he took a little detour through the field because that made him feel safer shortly afterwards a fourth man came along he was an advanced spiritual seeker and in the gathering gloom he could detect a halo of light around the sadhu's head this must be an enlightened man he thought and so he went up to him and prostrated people perceive jnanis through the distorting prison of their minds more than that they cannot do if you put on yellow glasses everything you see will be colored yellow <clears throat> change the color of the lenses and the color of what you perceive also changes the jnani has no distorting lenses or prisms to obscure fragment or change his vision he sees everything as god as his own self how do we get this un obscured unfragmented vision anamla swami says Bhagwan wrote in Uladu Narpadu that perceived objects are of the same nature as the one who perceives them. Uladu Narpadu that is a Tamil name of a book. In the waking state, the gross physical eyes see gross physical objects in the dream state the subtle eyes see subtle dream world objects beyond that there is the eye of the self since the self is infinite and immaterial what it sees is infinite and immaterial the jnani being self alone sees and knows only the self anam lai swami was referring to a verse for if one is a form the world and the god will also be so if one is not a form who can see their forms and how can what what is seen be of a different nature to the eye self the eye is the limitless eye bhagwan's explanation of this verse can be found in maha yoga if the eye that sees to if the eye that sees be the eye of flesh then gross forms are seen if the eye be assisted by lenses then even invisible things are seen to have form if the mind be that eye then subtle forms are seen thus the seeing eye and the object seen are of the same nature that is if the eye be itself a form it sees nothing but forms but neither the physical eye or the mind has any power of vision of its own the real eye is the self as he is formless being the pure and infinite consciousness the reality he does not see forms anam lai swami now continues with his answer the self shines all the time if you cannot see it because your mind has obscured it or fragmented it you have to control your vision you have to stop observing with the eye of the mind because that eye can only see what the mind projects in front of it if you want to see with the eye of the self is the projector of the mind of the infin infinite eye of the self will then reveal 
गिव दैट ऑल इज वन एंड इंडिविजुअल क्वेश्चन put to anomaly show i'm going back to the question of how to determine who is and who is not a gyani can we not come to some valid conclusion by studying his life and his teachings will not his state be somehow reflected in the life he leads anomaly swami replies if you cannot determine the answer to this question by studying the teachings or the behavior of a person you think might be a gyani these are not reliable indicators some gyanis may stay silent others may talk a lot some are active in the world some withdraw from it some end up as teachers while others are content to stay hidden some behave like saints whereas others act like madmen the same piece is not affected by modes of behavior but there may be no other common factor question gyanis are supposed to have an equality of reason can we not decide whether someone may be a gyani on the basis of whether he treats people around him equally anamla swami gyanis remain ap- absorbed in the self at all times and their apparent behavior is just a reflection of the circumstances they find themselves in some may appear to be egalitarian others may not they play their allotted roles and though they may seem to be involved in them as ordinary people would be they are not really touched by any of the events that occur in their lives equal vision may be their internal equanimity may be their but, but don't expect all gyanis to behave in a prescribed egalitarian way bhagwan often used to cite king janaka as an example of a gyani who was fully involved in the affairs of the world but when his palace caught fire and was burning to the ground he was the only person in the vicinity who was not disturbed in the same story there was a group of sadhus who lived near the palace when the fire began to spread they panicked and began to collect their sticks their spare copies their water pots and so on they had very few possessions but they were still very attached to them and they definitely did not want to lose them to the fire they were more worried about their space underwear than <clears throat> janaka was about his palace janaka was his palace burned to the ground with complete equanimity when you have this gyana your inner peace is a solid rock then cannot be disturbed being rich and being a king will not obstruct gyana it is just a question of having the right attitude there is a story in yoga vasishta about a king called mahabali he had lost interest in his kingdom his riches and his pleasures because he had developed a strong desire for a gyana he summoned his guru sukracharya to the court and asked him what he should do to attain gyana mahabali was assuming that sukracharya would tell him to renounce his kingdom and go to the forest and meditate he said sukracharya told him i am the self you are the self all is the self that is all you need to know to attain this gyana you are looking for i cannot give you any lengthy teaching today because i have to go and attend a meeting of the gods anyway lengthy teachings are not needed just remember the words i have told you if you can hold on to this knowledge i am the self at all times no further practice or initiation will be necessary there is another story about janaka that i like a man called sukra brahma called on janaka for spiritual advice i am a seeker of truth he has said what can you tell me what did you see while you were coming here asked janaka i saw house is made of sugar answered sukra brahma i saw streets made of sugar i saw trees and flowers made of sugar i saw animals made of sugar i saw your palace and saw that it was made of sugar everything i saw was made of sugar as i stand here i say that you are made of sugar and that i also am made of sugar janaka laughed and said you are a ripe soul you don't need any teaching you are a question is put to swami anamlai 
the question says some people realize the self just by hearing the guru's words how is this possible anamlai swami replies disciples who are spiritually very advanced can realize the self as soon as they hear the truth from an enlightened guru because the words of such a being have great power if you are in this advanced state they will reach your inner core and reveal to you the peace that is your real nature when the guru tells you that you are the self there is a power and an authority in those words that can make them become your own reality if you are pure and ready no practice will be required one word from a gyani and his state will become yours too another question is put to anamlai swami how does the mind project this world i see in front of me anamlai swami replied everything we see in this waking state is a dream these dreams are our thoughts made manifest bad thoughts make bad dreams and good thoughts make good dreams and if you have no thought you don't dream at all but even if you do dreams you must understand that your dream is also the self you don't have to stress thoughts or be absolutely thoughtless to abide as the self if you know that even your waking and sleeping dreams are the self then the thoughts and the dreams they produce can go on they will not be a problem for you any more just be the self at all times in this state you will know that everything that appears to you is just a dream another question question says what i am trying to say is how do thoughts and desires create this world we live in it does not seem possible that all this that i see could be a manifestation of my hidden desires and namla iswain replies imagine that a man has to catch a train at 3 am he goes to bed thinking i have to wake up before that so i can catch the train then sometime during the night he has a dream in which he wakes up at 2:30 he remembers the train journey gets out of bed goes to the station board the train and takes his seat then he thinks i got up early this morning i am a bit sleepy i will lie down and have a nap he stretches himself out and goes to sleep the next morning he wakes up at 8 am in his own bed at home and realizes that he has missed the train his whole journey had just been a dream that had been provoked by the thought i must wake up before 3 am the waking state which you take to the real is just an unfolding dream that has appeared to you and manifested in front of you on account of some hidden desire or fear your vasanas sprout and expand miraculously creating a whole waking dream world for you see it as a dream recognize that it is just an expansion of your thoughts don't lose sight of the self the substratum on which this vast unbelievable dream is projected if you hold on to the knowledge i am the self you will know that the dreams are also the self and you won't get entangled in them another question all is one may be the truth but once one cannot treat everything in the world equally in daily life one still has to discriminate and make distinction anamlai swam i once went for a walk near the housing board building government flats that were built in the 1970s about 300 meters from anamlai swam jashram there was a sewage trench on one side of the building i could smell the stench of the sewage even though i was a long way away i stayed away from it because i did not want to be nauseated by the bad smell in circumstances such as these you don't say all is one 
everything is the self and paddled through the service. The knowledge, everything is the self may be there, but that doesn't mean that you have to put yourself in dangerous or health threatening places. When you have become one with the self, a great power takes you over and runs your life for you. It looks after your body, it puts you in the right place at the right time, it makes you say the right things to the right people. You meet this power takes you over so completely you no longer have any ability to decide or discriminate. The ego that thinks I must do this or I should not do that is no longer there. The self simply animates you and makes you do all the things that need to be done. If you are not in this state, then use your discrimination wisely. You can choose to sit in a flower garden and enjoy the scent of the blooms or you can go down to that trench I told you about and make yourself sick by inhaling the fumes there. So while you still have an ego and the power of discrimination that goes with it, use it to inhale the fragrance that you find in the presence of an enlightened being. If you spend time in the proximity of a jnani, his peace will sink into you to such an extent that you will find yourself in a state of peace. If instead you choose to spend all your time with people whose minds are always full of bad thoughts, their mental energy and vibrations will start to seep into you. I tell you regularly, you are the self, everything is the self. If this is not your experience, pretending that all is one may get you into trouble. Advaita may be the ultimate experience, but it is not something that a mind that still sees distinctions can practice. Electricity is a useful form of energy, but it is also potentially harmful. Use it wisely. Don't put your finger in the socket, thinking all is one. You need a body that is in good working order in order to realize the self. Realizing the self is the only useful and worthy activity in this life. So keep the body in good repair till that goal is achieved. Afterwards, the self will take care of everything and you won't have to worry about anything anymore. In fact, you won't be able to because the mind that previously did the worrying, the choosing and the discriminating will no longer be there. In that state, you won't need it and you won't miss it. Question. What should be the right attitude when one sits in the presence of a jnani? Anamla Swami replied, just keep quiet. Make contact with the silence of the self within. This is the way of making contact with your guru. And it is also the best attitude to have when you are sitting in his presence. Another question is put to Anamlai Swami. I understand this is also my inner feeling, my own belief of what I need to do, but knowing it does not produce the desired result. I know that I can make contact with my real Guru by abiding as the self within, but it rarely happens. I cannot abide in that state all the time. And when I am out of that state, I am acutely aware of the separation. Then when I feel that separation, I feel a need to be in the Guru's physical presence. The advice, go back to the self within, is not so attractive then because I know I cannot do it. Anamla Swami replied, who is feeling this separation? Who is separate from whom? Ask yourself this question whenever these thoughts rise. I remember a devotee who got very attached to Bhagwan's feet. He would touch his feet and then try to hold on to them for a long time. One day Bhagwan said to him, don't get attached to these feet because one day they will disappear if you are so attached to physical things. When they go, you will be depressed and you will feel miserable. Hold on to the self within, that is the Guru's true feet. It will never go away because it is eternal. The self abides within you as your Guru. It is up to you to find him there and to stay with him. The light of the self cannot be extinguished. 
it is eternal and immanent it is not like ordinary light that can be switched on and off once it is discovered within it will be on all the time the incident that anam rai swami reported in his final answer also seems to have been recorded by sadhu natananda in his tamil book sri ramana darshanam in a section about devotees who wanted to hold on to hold on to the guru's feet or show excessive respect to him he has bhagwan give out two emphatic statements the first to a devotee who was holding on to his feet and the second to another devotee who was performing an over elaborate prostration only the supreme self which is ever shining in your heart as the reality is the sadguru the pure awareness which is shining as the inward illumination i is his gracious feet the contact with these inner holy feet alone can give you true redemption joining the eye of reflected consciousness still the bhasha which is your sense of individuality to these holy feet which are the real consciousness is the union of the feet and the head which is the real significance of the word asi the verb in tattvam asi that thou art as these inner holy feet can be held naturally and unceasingly hereafter with an inward turned mind cling to that inner awareness which is your own real nature this alone is the proper way for the removal of bondage and the attainment of supreme truth the benefit of performing namaskaram prostrating to the guru is only the removal of the ego that is not attained except by total surrender within the heart of each devotee the gracious guru is giving darshan in the form of consciousness since to surrender is to offer fully in silence the subsided ego which is a name and form thought to the aham sapurna the effulgence of i the real holy feet of the gracious guru since this is so self realization cannot be attained by a bowing of the body but only by bowing of the ego a foreign woman came to see anam lai swami while she was prostrating to him she seemed to become unconscious of her surroundings and she remained lying on the floor at his feet for about 10 minutes this was not the first time that she had fallen into this state while in anam lai swami's presence after watching her for some time he shouted at her anam lai swami you should not go into laya a trance like state like this it is becoming a habit with you it may give you some kind of temporary happiness but it is not a happiness that helps you spiritually it is the same as sleep even bodily activities are better than this laya get out of this habit addressing the other people present people occasionally went into states like this in front of bhagwan he never encouraged them even the ones who appear to be in deep meditation i remember one occasion when bhagwan noticed a man who had been sitting motionless in the hall for at least an hour apparently in a deep meditation bhagwan was not fooled he called to kunju swami and others who were present shout at him shake him and when he wakes up take him on grief perfection this is no better than sleep this state is not good for him he is just wasting his time sitting like this bhagwan warned us about this state and he often cited stories of sadhus who had been stuck in this state for years one of the most frequently told was a story about a sadhu who asked his disciple for a glass of water while he was waiting for the man to return he went into a deep laya state that persisted for many many years he was in this state so long his disciple died the river changed its course and different rulers came and went when he opened his eyes his first comment was where is my glass of water before he went into laya this thought was 
uppermost in his mind and decades later this thought was still there bhagwan's comment on this story was these states are not helpful they are not samadhi the woman who had been in riyadh then asked the next question question whenever i start meditating soon after i start i fall into these states how can i prevent these laya states from coming and taking me over anam lai swami replies keep practicing self inquiry this is the way to avoid laya the mind usually has two habits either it is occupied with many thoughts and engaged in activities or it goes back to sleep but for some people there is this third option falling into this laya state you should not indulge in it because once it becomes a habit it becomes addictive addictive it is a pleasant state be in but if you fall very deeply into it it becomes very hard to get out of it you know what this state is like because you have been in it many times as soon as you feel the first symptoms of an approaching trance get up and walk around don't remain sitting or lying walk around or do some work and above all keep the practice of self inquiry if you practice self inquiry constantly you will never find yourself falling into laya you can conquer this habit you just need to be attentive and to do self inquiry another question bhagwan once remarked what is the value of knowing god if we do not know the name of our own i we also spoke about the i i vibration saying that it was an emanation from uh, emanation of the self when bhagwan spoke of i i did he mean that it was shabd nadi a subtle sound or is it merely the feeling i i anam lai swami replied they both indicate and mean the self question is the sign sound also the self anam lai swami the sound is happening in the self question is it same as the self or is it the reflection anam lai it is also a part of the self question so is it like the white color of milk in set preable from the milk anam lai swami reply yes another question i am asking this because i hear the sound all the time but i do not know if i feel the i i in the heart there is a feeling that i ought to be going deeper so i ask myself what is the feeling of the sound is this a good practice anam lai swami replies let me give you an example the fan over our head is spinning around a stream of cool air is coming from it but we also hear the noise of the motor both perceptions originate from the working of the fan it is the same with the self the soundless sound of the self goes on all the time by itself it does not make a sound it is this subtle sound if you tune into this sound you can't actually listen because it is not a physical noise that tuning in will lead you to the peace of the self that peace is prior to and beyond this very subtle pulsation pulsation when you reach that final peace that ultimate stillness the sound will disappear in the self in that final place there is no sound there is only peace somewhat like the peaceful soundless state that is experienced in deep sleep however full awareness remains there it is not an unconscious state most people cannot hear or be aware of the subtle inner vibration because it is drowned out by the physical noise of the outer world and by the persistent mental noise of the mind the only people who can hear the sound are those in whom thoughts have mostly disappeared one needs to be in deep level of mental peace in order to be aware of this sound this subtle vibration is resonating all the time in all people by virtually no one hears it because preoccupation with thoughts covers it up bhagwan was not the first teacher to talk about this subtle sound him himalika for example mentioned in tripura rahasya so this inner sound is not something newly discovered close your mental and physical ears and you will hear this vibration resonating all the time so here
dear i stop the video for the day please subscribe my channel and like share and comment on my video thank you dear friend